The Western Allies of World War II launched the largest amphibious invasion in history when they assaulted Normandy, located on the northern coast of France, on 6 June 1944. The invaders were able to establish a beachhead as part of Operation Overlord after a successful D-Day, the first day of the invasion. Allied land forces came from the United States, Britain, Canada, and Free French forces. In the weeks following the invasion, Polish forces and contingents from Belgium, Czechoslovakia, Greece and the Netherlands participated in the ground campaign, most also provided air and naval support alongside elements of the Royal Australian Air Force, the Royal New Zealand Air Force, and the Royal Norwegian Navy. The Normandy invasion began with overnight parachute and glider landings, massive air attacks and naval bombardments. In the early morning, amphibious landings commenced on five beaches codenamed Sword, Juno, Gold, Omaha and Utah, with troops from the United States landing on Omaha and Utah, Great Britain landing on Gold and Sword and Canada landing on Juno. During the evening the remaining elements of the airborne divisions landed. Land forces used on D-Day sailed from bases along the south coast of England, the most important of these being Portsmouth. Topic. Planning. Allied forces rehearsed their D-Day roles for months before the invasion. On 28 April 1944, in South Devon on the English coast, 749 U.S. soldiers and sailors were killed when German torpedo boats surprised one of these landing exercises, Exercise Tiger. In the months leading up to the invasion, the Allied forces conducted a deception operation, Operation Fortitude, aimed at misleading the Germans with respect to the date and place of the invasion. There were several leaks prior to or on D-Day. Through the Cicero affair, the Germans obtained documents containing references to Overlord, but these documents lacked all detail. Double-cross agents, such as the Spaniard Juan Pujol, codenamed Garbo, played an important role in convincing the German high command that Normandy was at best a diversionary attack. U.S. Major General Henry Miller, Chief Supply Officer of the U.S. 9th Air Force, during a party at Claridge's Hotel in London complained to guests of the supply problems he was having but that after the invasion, which he told them would be before 15 June, supply would be easier. After being told, Eisenhower reduced Miller to Lieutenant Colonel Associated Press, June 10, 1944 and sent him back to the U.S. where he retired. Another such leak was General Charles de Gaulle's radio message after D-Day. He, unlike all the other leaders, stated that this invasion was the real invasion. This had the potential to ruin the Allied deceptions Fortitude North and Fortitude South. In contrast, Gen. Eisenhower referred to the landings as the initial invasion. Only 10 days each month were suitable for launching the operation. A day near the full moon was needed both for illumination during the hours of darkness and for the spring tide, the former to illuminate navigational landmarks for the crews of aircraft, gliders and landing craft, and the latter to expose defensive obstacles placed by the German forces in the surf on the seaward approaches to the beaches. A full moon occurred on the 6th of June. Allied Expeditionary Force Supreme Commander Dwight D. Eisenhower had tentatively selected 5 June as the date for the assault. The weather was fine during most of May, but deteriorated in early June. On 4 June, conditions were clearly unsuitable for a landing, wind and high seas would make it impossible to launch landing craft from larger ships at sea, low clouds would prevent aircraft finding their targets. The Allied troop convoys already at sea were forced to take shelter in bays and inlets on the south coast of Britain for the night. It seemed possible that everything would have to be cancelled and the troops returned to their embarkation camps which would be almost impossible, as the enormous movement of follow-up formations into them was already proceeding. The next full moon period would be nearly a month away. At a vital meeting on 5 June, Eisenhower's chief meteorologist group Captain J.M. Stag forecast a brief improvement for 6 June. Commander of all land forces for the invasion General Bernard Montgomery and Eisenhower's Chief of Staff General Walter Bedell Smith wished to proceed with the invasion. Commander of the Allied Air Forces Air Chief Marshal Lee Mallory was doubtful, but Allied Naval Commander-in-Chief Admiral Bertram Ramsey believed that conditions would be marginally favorable. On the strength of Stag's forecast, Eisenhower ordered the invasion to proceed. 
As a result, prevailing overcast skies limited Allied air support, and no serious damage would be done to the beach defenses on Omaha and Juneau. The Germans meanwhile took comfort from the existing poor conditions, which were worse over northern France than over the English Channel itself, and believed no invasion would be possible for several days. Some troops stood down and many senior officers were away for the weekend. Field Marshal Erwin Rommel took a few days' leave to celebrate his wife's birthday, while dozens of division, regimental and battalion commanders were away from their posts conducting war games just prior to the invasion. <laughs> codenames The Allies assigned codenames to the various operations involved in the invasion. Overlord was the name assigned to the establishment of a large-scale lodgment on the northern portion of the continent. The first phase, the establishment of a secure foothold, was codenamed Neptune. According to the D-Day Museum, the armed forces use codenames to refer to the planning and execution of specific military operations. Operation Overlord was the codename for the Allied invasion of Northwest Europe. The assault phase of Operation Overlord was known as Operation Neptune. Operation Neptune began on D-Day, the 6th of June 1944, and ended on the 30th of June 1944. By this time, the Allies had established a firm foothold in Normandy. Operation Overlord also began on D-Day and continued until Allied forces crossed the River Seine on the 19th of August 1944. Officers with knowledge of D-Day were not to be sent where there was the slightest danger of being captured. These officers were given the codename of bigot, derived from the words to gib, to Gibraltar that was stamped on the papers of officers who took part in the North African invasion in 1942. On the night of 27 April, during Exercise Tiger, a pre-invasion exercise off the coast of Slapton Sands Beach, several American LSTs were attacked by German E-boats and among the 638 Americans killed in the attack and a further 308 killed by friendly fire, 10 bigots were listed as missing as the invasion would be cancelled if any were captured or unaccounted for their fate was given the highest priority and eventually all 10 bodies were recovered topic <laughs> <laughs> allied order of battle topic <laughs> <laughs> d day the following major units were landed on d day the 6th of june 1944 a more detailed order of battle for D-Day itself can be found at Normandy landings and list of Allied forces in the Normandy campaign. British 6th Airborne Division British 1st Corps, 3rd British Infantry Division and the British 27th Armoured Brigade. 3rd Canadian Infantry Division, 2nd Canadian Armoured Brigade British 30th Corps, British 50th Infantry Division and British 8th Armoured Brigade. British 79th Armoured Division U.S. 5th Corps, U.S. 1st Infantry Division and U.S. 29th Infantry Division. U.S. 7th Corps, U.S. 4th Infantry Division, U.S. 101st Airborne Division, U.S. 82nd Airborne Division. The total number of troops landed on D-Day was around 130,000 to 156,000 roughly half American and the other half from the Commonwealth realms. Topic. Subsequent days. The total troops, vehicles and supplies landed over the period of the invasion were By the end of the 11th of June D plus 5, 326,547 troops, 54,186 vehicles and 104,428 tons of supplies. By the 30th of June D plus 2, 4, over 850,000 men, 148,000 vehicles, and 570,000 tons of supplies. By 4 July 1 million men had been landed. Topic. Naval participants The invasion fleet was drawn from eight different navies, comprising 6,939 vessels, 1,213 warships, 4,126 transport vessels landing ships and landing craft, and 736 ancillary craft and 864 merchant vessels, the overall commander of the Allied Naval Expeditionary Force, providing close protection and bombardment at the beaches, was Admiral Sir Bertram Ramsey. 
The Allied Naval Expeditionary Force was divided into two naval task forces, Western Rear Admiral Alan G. Kirk and Eastern Rear Admiral Sir Philip Vian. The warships provided cover for the transports against the enemy, whether in the form of surface warships, submarines, or as an aerial attack, and gave support to the landings through shore bombardment. These ships included the Allied Task Force. O. Topic: German order of battle. The number of military forces at the disposal of Nazi Germany reached its peak during 1944. Tanks on the East Front peaked at 5,202 in November 1944, while total aircraft in the Luftwaffe inventory peaked at 5,041 in December 1944. By D-Day 157 German divisions were stationed in the Soviet Union, 6 in Finland, 12 in Norway, 6 in Denmark, 9 in Germany, 21 in the Balkans, 26 in Italy and 59 in France, Belgium and the Netherlands. However, these statistics are somewhat misleading since a significant number of the divisions in the East were depleted. German records indicate that the average personnel complement was at about 50% in the spring of 1944. A more detailed order of battle for D Day itself can be found at Normandy landings. <laughs> Atlantic Wall Standing in the way of the Allies was the English Channel, an obstacle that had frustrated the ambitions of the Spanish Armada and Napoleon Bonaparte's navy. Compounding the difficulty of invasion was the extensive Atlantic Wall, ordered by Hitler in his Directive 51. Believing that any forthcoming landings would be timed for high tide this caused the landings to be timed for low tide, Hitler had the entire wall fortified with tank top turrets and extensive barbed wire, and laid a million mines to deter landing craft. The sector that was attacked was guarded by four divisions. Topic. Divisional areas The following units were deployed in a static defensive mode in the areas of the actual landings. 716th Infantry Division static consisted mainly of those unfit for active duty and released prisoners. 352nd Infantry Division, a well-trained unit containing combat veterans. 91st Air Landing Division Luftland, air transported, a regular infantry division, trained, and equipped to be transported by air. 709th Infantry Division static. Like the 716th, this division included a number of Ost battalions led by German personnel. Topic. Adjacent divisional areas Other divisions occupied the areas around the landing zones, including 243rd Infantry Division Static, Generalleutnant Heinz Helmich. This coastal defense division protected the western coast of the Cotentin Peninsula. 920th Infantry Regiment 2 battalions, 921st Infantry Regiment 922nd Infantry Regiment 711th Infantry Division Static Generalleutnant Joseph Reichert. This division defended the western part of the Pays de Cox. 731st Infantry Regiment 744th Infantry Regiment 30th Mobile Brigade Oberstleutnant Freiherr von und zu Aufsis, comprising three bicycle battalions. Topic. Armored Reserves Rommel's defensive measures were frustrated by a dispute over armored doctrine. In addition to his two army groups, Rundstedt also commanded the headquarters of Panzer Group West under General Leo Geyr von Schweppenberg usually referred to as von Geyr. This formation was nominally an administrative HQ for Rundstedt's armored and mobile formations, but it was later to be brought into the line in Normandy and renamed 5th Panzer Army. Geyr and Rommel disagreed over the deployment and use of the vital panzer divisions. Rommel recognized that the Allies would possess air superiority and would be able to harass his movements from the air. He therefore proposed that the armored formations be deployed close to the invasion beaches. In his words, it was better to have one panzer division facing the invaders on the first day, than three panzer divisions three days later when the Allies would already have established a firm beachhead. 
Geyr argued for the standard doctrine that the panzer formations should be concentrated in a central position around Paris and Rouen, and deployed en masse against the main Allied beachhead when this had been identified. The argument was eventually brought before Hitler for arbitration. He characteristically imposed an unworkable compromise solution. Only three panzer divisions were given to Rommel, too few to cover all the threatened sectors. The remainder, nominally under Gare's control, were actually designated as being in OKW reserve. Only three of these were deployed close enough to intervene immediately against any invasion of northern France, the other four were dispersed in southern France and the Netherlands. Hitler reserved to himself the authority to move the divisions in OKW reserve, or commit them to action. On 6 June many Panzer Division commanders were unable to move because Hitler had not given the necessary authorization, and his staff refused to wake him upon news of the invasion. <laughs> Army Group B Reserve 21st Panzer Division General Mahor Edgar Feuchtinger, was deployed near Caen as a mobile striking force as part of the Army Group B Reserve. However, Rommel placed it so close to the coastal defences that, under standing orders in case of invasion, several of its infantry and anti-aircraft units would come under the orders of the fortress divisions on the coast, reducing the effective strength of the division. The other two armoured divisions over which Rommel had operational control, the 2nd Panzer Division and 116th Panzer Division, were deployed near the Pas de Calais in accordance with German views about the likely Allied landing sites. Neither was moved from the Pas de Calais for at least 14 days after the invasion. Topic. OKW Reserve The other mechanized divisions capable of intervening in Normandy were retained under the direct control of the German Armed Forces HQ OKW and were initially denied to Rommel. Four divisions were deployed to Normandy within seven days of the invasion. 12th SS Panzer Division Hitlerjugend Brigadefuhrer Fritz Witt was stationed to the southeast. Its officers and NCOs this division had a very weak core of NCOs in Normandy with only slightly more than 50% of its authorized strength were long-serving veterans, but the junior soldiers had all been recruited directly from the Hitler Youth Movement at the age of 17 in 1943. It was to acquire a reputation for ferocity and war crimes in the coming battle. Panzer Lair Division General Mahor Fritz Bayerlein. Further to the southwest was an elite unit, originally formed by amalgamating the instructing staff at various training establishments. Not only were its personnel of high quality, but the division also had unusually high numbers of the latest and most capable armored vehicles. 1st SS Panzer Division Liebstandarte SS Adolf Hitler was refitting in Belgium on the Netherlands border after being decimated on the Eastern Front. 17th SS Panzergrenadier Division Gotts von Berlekingen Oberführer Werner Ostendorf was based on Thauers, south of the Loire River, and although equipped with assault guns instead of tanks and lacking in other transport such that one battalion each from the 37th and 38th Panzergrenadier regiments moved by bicycle, it provided the first major counterattack against the American advance at Corentin on 13 June. Three other divisions the 2nd SS Panzer Division Das Reich, which had been refitting at Montauban in southern France, and the 9th SS Panzer Division Hohenstaufen and 10th SS Panzer Division Frunsberg which had been in transit from the Eastern Front on 6 June, were committed to battle in Normandy around 21 days after the first landings. One more armoured division, the 9th Panzer Division, saw action only after the American breakout from the beachhead. Two other armoured divisions which had been in the west on 6 June the 11th Panzer Division and 19th Panzer Division did not see action in Normandy. Topic. Leaders The following is a list of leaders in the Battle of Normandy. Topic. Landings Topic. Allied establishment in France The Allied invasion plans had called for the capture of saint lô Caen, and Bayou on the first day, with all the beaches linked except Utah, and Sword the last linked with paratroopers and a front line 10 to 16 kilometers 6 to 10 miles from the beaches. However, practically none of these objectives had been achieved. 
It took six weeks for British and Canadian troops to capture Caen, as they faced seven panzer divisions, while their American allies, although advancing more rapidly, faced only two of these divisions. Overall the casualties had not been as heavy as some had feared around 10,000 compared to the 20,000 Churchill had estimated and the bridgeheads had withstood the expected counterattacks. Once the beachhead was established, two artificial mulberry harbours were towed across the English Channel in segments and made operational around D plus 3 9th of June. One was constructed at Aramanches by British forces, the other at Omaha Beach by American forces. By 19 June, when severe storms interrupted the landing of supplies for several days and destroyed the Omaha Harbor, the British had landed 314,547 men, 54,000 vehicles, and 102,000 tons of supplies, while the Americans put ashore 314,504 men, 41,000 vehicles, and 116,000 tons of supplies. Around 9,000 tons of materiel were landed daily at the Aramanches Harbour until the end of August 1944, by which time the port of Cherbourg had been secured by the Allies and had begun to return to service. In addition, with the installation of Pluto in August 1944, the Allies had fuel piped over directly from England without having to rely on vulnerable tankers. Topic: <laughs> Assessment of the battle. The Normandy landings were the first successful opposed landings across the English Channel in over eight centuries. They were costly in terms of men, but the defeat inflicted on the Germans was one of the largest of the war. Strategically, the campaign led to the loss of the German position in most of France and the secure establishment of a new major front. In larger context the Normandy landings helped the Soviets on the Eastern Front, who were facing the bulk of the German forces and, to a certain extent, contributed to the shortening of the conflict there. Although there was a shortage of artillery ammunition, at no time were the Allies critically short of any necessity. This was a remarkable achievement considering they did not hold a port until Cherbourg fell. By the time of the breakout the Allies also enjoyed a considerable superiority in numbers of troops approximately 7 to 2 and armoured vehicles approximately 4 to 1 which helped overcome the natural advantages the terrain gave to the German defenders. Allied intelligence and counterintelligence efforts were successful beyond expectations. The Operation Fortitude deception before the invasion kept German attention focused on the Pas de Calais, and indeed high-quality German forces were kept in this area, away from Normandy, until July. Prior to the invasion, few German reconnaissance flights took place over Britain, and those that did saw only the dummy staging areas. Ultra-decrypts of German communications had been helpful as well, exposing German dispositions and revealing their plans such as the Mortain counterattack. Allied air operations also contributed significantly to the invasion, via close tactical support, interdiction of German lines of communication preventing timely movement of supplies and reinforcements—particularly the critical panzer units, and rendering the Luftwaffe ineffective in Normandy. Although the impact upon armoured vehicles was less than expected, air activity intimidated these units and cut their supplies. Despite initial heavy losses in the assault phase, Allied morale remained high. Casualty rates among all the armies were tremendous, and the Commonwealth forces had to use a recently created category, double intense, to be able to describe them. Topic: <laughs> German leadership. German commanders at all levels failed to react to the assault phase in a timely manner. Communications problems exacerbated the difficulties caused by allied air and naval firepower. Local commanders also seemed incapable of the task of fighting an aggressive defense on the beach, as Rommel had envisioned. The German high command remained fixated on the Calais area, and von Rundstedt was not permitted to commit the armored reserve. When it was finally released late in the day, its chance of success was greatly reduced. Overall, despite considerable Allied material superiority, the Germans kept the Allies bottled up in a small beachhead for nearly two months, aided immeasurably by terrain factors. Although there were several known disputes among the Allied commanders, their tactics and strategy were essentially determined by agreement among the main commanders. By contrast, the German leaders were bullied and their decisions interfered with by OKW. Field Marshals von Rundstedt and Rommel repeatedly asked Hitler for more discretion but were refused. 
Rundstedt was removed from his command on 29 June after he bluntly told the Chief of Staff at Hitler's Armed Forces HQ Field Marshal Keitel to "...make peace, you idiots." Rommel was severely injured by Allied aircraft on 17 July. 60,000 of the 850,000 in Rundstedt's command were raised from the many prisoners of war taken on the Eastern Front. Many surrendered or deserted at the first available opportunity. War memorials and tourism The beaches at Normandy are still referred to on maps and signposts by their invasion codenames. There are several vast cemeteries in the area. The American Cemetery, in colville sur mer contains row upon row of identical white crosses and stars of David, immaculately kept, commemorating the American dead. Commonwealth Graves, maintained in many locations by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, uses white headstones engraved with the person's religious or metal Victoria Cross or George Cross only symbol and their unit insignia. The Bayou War Cemetery, with 4,648 burials, is the largest British cemetery of the war. The largest cemetery in Normandy is the Le Cam German War Cemetery, with 21,222 burials, which features granite stones almost flush with the ground and groups of low-set crosses. There is also a Polish cemetery. At the Bayou Memorial, a monument erected by Britain has a Latin inscription on the memorial reads, Noza Julielmo Victi Victoris Patrium Librivimus. Freely translated, this reads, we, once conquered by William, have now set free the conqueror's native land." Streets near the beaches are still named after the units that fought there, and occasional markers commemorate notable incidents. At significant points, such as Point du Hoc and Pegasus Bridge, there are plaques, memorials or small museums. The Mulberry Harbour still sits in the sea at Aramanches. In St. Mir Aigles, a dummy paratrooper hangs from the church spire. On Juno Beach, the Canadian government has built the Juno Beach Information Centre, commemorating one of the most significant events in Canadian military history. In England the most significant memorial is the D-Day Museum in South Sea, Hampshire. The museum was opened in 1984 to commemorate the 40th anniversary of D-Day. Its centrepiece is the Overlord embroidery commissioned by Lord Dulverton of Batsford as a tribute to the sacrifice and heroism of those men and women who took part in Operation Overlord. On 5 June 1994 a drumhead service was held on South Sea Common adjacent the D-Day Museum. This service was attended by U.S. President Bill Clinton, Queen Elizabeth II and over 100,000 members of the public. Dramatizations The Battle of Normandy has been the topic of many films, television shows, songs, computer games and books. Many dramatizations focus on the initial landings, and these are covered at Normandy landings. Some examples that cover the wider battle include Films Le Bataillon du Ciel, Skies Battalion, a 1947 French film directed by Alexander Esway based on the book of Joseph Kessel, Free French SAS Paratroopers, Special Air Service in Brittany from the 5th of June to August 1944. The Longest Day, a 1962 film based on the book of the same name by Cornelius Ryan. The Americanization of Emily, a 1964 film written by Paddy Chayefsky, directed by Arthur Hiller and starring James Garner and Julie Andrews. Overlord, a 1975 black and white film written and directed by Stuart Cooper, set around the D-Day invasion. The Big Red One, a 1980 film directed by Samuel Fuller and starring Lee Marvin. Un jour avant l'aube, One Day Before Dawn, a 1994 French television film directed by Jacques Erto, Free French Sass in Brittany. Saving Private Ryan, a 1998 Academy Award winning American film directed by Steven Spielberg and starring Tom Hanks and Matt Damon. Band of Brothers, a 2001 American miniseries produced by Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks based on the book of the same name by Stephen Ambrose. I, Countdown to D-Day, a 2004 American television film directed by Robert Harmon and written by Lionel Chetwind which emphasizes the difficult decisions General Dwight D. Eisenhower had to make, while dealing with the varied personalities of his direct subordinates, in order to lead Operation Overlord. 
My Way, a 2011 South Korean war film by Kong Zha Gyu, starring Jang Dong Gun along with Japanese actor Joe Odagiri and Chinese actress Fan Bingbing. See also D-Day Daily Telegraph Crossword Security Alarm Notes Footnotes Citations References Further reading External links D-Day Overlord, A Fight for Freedom The Normandy Campaign, History, Documents, Testimonies, Maps U.S. Army's official interactive D-Day website The Normandy Invasion at the United States Army Center of Military History U.S. Navy Online Library of Selected Images, Normandy Invasion Original Document, D-Day Statement from Dwight D. Eisenhower D-Day Museum Portsmouth Omar Nelson Bradley, Lt. General FUSAG 12th AG, Omar Bradley's D-Day June 6, 1944 Maps restored, preserved and displayed at Historical Registry BBC Archive of Personal Recollections of D-Day Justin Museum of Military History, first-hand accounts of D-Day Illustrated article about Omaha Beach at Battlefields Europe